so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Bang, who's a very old friend of the MC. Um, without going into too much history, I can say that Dan Bang started uh, this uh, link to the MC back during his bachelor's uh, at the same time as me as a research assistant, right? When the IMC was just a project, was in the center at the hospital, back when uh, research assistants didn't get paid at all, <laughs> but in return um, went to uh, China to collect data for a month and present research and, and so on, which is quite uh, useful because then actually is fluent in Chinese. And um, since then, he's been doing a PhD in Oxford, uh, postdoc at UCL in London, visiting uh, the States as well, he's done lots of very impressive, amazing things. And now we are happy to have him back um, on a Lundbeck Fellowship from starting uh, January next year, right? So in the meantime, lots of time to have fun and do your, finish your yeah. existing project. But, um, but yeah, um, it's my pleasure to give the floor to you, uh, Dan Bray. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks for that kind introduction. Also had the, let me just make sure this also had a slide just to acknowledge the link to Aarhus, which as Carsten mentioned, I did my undergrad in linguistics at Aarhus University. And well, it's really because of Carsten that I went on this trajectory. So <laughs> I came back from, I think it was on an exchange day in Hong Kong. And then when yes. I came back, Carsten had been working with Bahador and Luta, Chris and Andreas. And that was sort of my link into the IMC. And so a lot of s small, Things have led to this uh, complicated part. Yeah. I'll um, take all the credit. Yeah, you should. Um, <laughs> and uh, as Carsten mentioned, I've been I've had a Henry Rowcombe Fellowship at UCL since 2019. Now I mainly present the work that I've done during that period today, and then towards the end I'll, I'll, I'll sort of turn towards the future. I've also done work on group decision making, decision confidence, perceptual decision making. Um, it'll feed into a little bit into the work I'll talk about today, but I'll, I'll leave that for, for another day. Okay, so the brain is a complex distributed computational system. We have many different processes running at the same time. As I'm giving this talk to you, I'm processing incoming sensory information. You might be reaching for your coffee cup. You might be thinking back on the fun days when I was here 10 years ago. Um, you might have certain feelings associated with that. And there are huge advantages to this parallel processing architecture, but it also requires a, a high degree of central coordination. Because if the fire alarm goes off, you need something to reset the entire system or instruct the entire system as to what to do next. And this is where new modulatory systems, um, such as the dopamine system, the serotonin system, and the noradrenaline system come in. So these systems, um, I don't know, maybe I should use the pointer here so people at home can see. So these, so these systems originate in, in small nuclei in the midbrain, and they project widely throughout the brain, and, and, re, and in this way release neurochemicals to a diverse range of neural structures. So you can think of these systems as providing a global broadcasting service for system-critical information. And these systems are relevant for all aspects of neuroscience. They're involved in the regulation of the excitability and plasticity of neuronal populations, they support a range of cognitive processes. They're implicated in a range of disease states, such as Parkinson's, addiction, anxiety. And they're a major pharm pharmacological target. But it's not just pharma pharmacological agents that affect neuromodulatory systems. Things like the food you consume, stimulants, recreational drugs, all work on these systems, and are thought to have their effect through these systems. Now, one, one challenge for for our understanding of neuromodulatory systems and the role in, in health and disease is that most of our knowledge comes from animal models. Because in animals we have um, techniques for monitoring neuromodulation and neuromodulatory nuclei with, with fine spatial temporal resolution. We also have techniques for manipulating these systems. However, there's a conceptual gap. Animals are not humans. So the human, human brains are different. But the basic neuromodulatory machinery may be conserved across species, but it operates on distinct neural hardware, hardware in humans. 
and human cognition is different. And I think this point is particularly critical when you want to speak to the role of these systems in mental health states. Because arguably you could say that it's hard to reproduce the, a lot of the unique aspects of mental health diseases in animal models. But the methods we have in humans lack the spatial temporal position that we have in animals. For example, pet imaging is slow. It cannot capture the sub-second computations that are believed to be supported by these neuromodulatory systems. And things like pharmacology are diffused. When you give someone a drug, you sort of wash the entire system pharmacologically. So the question is, when we do our human experiments, are we really probing the same biological systems that we study in the animal? It's crucial that we bridge these gaps. It's crucial for understanding the healthy brain and brain diseases. And I'll, today I'll, I'll present work where we have tried to bridge this gap using methods that allow us to monitor these systems with the same spatial temporal position that we have had in animals. The technique that, that, that we use in the work I'll present today is called fast scan cyclic voltammetry, or voltammetry for short. It has a long history in animal models and and about 10 years ago, my US collaborators, Ken Kishida and Reed Montague, translated this technique from animals into humans. And you might know Reed from, from the dopamine prediction error hypothesis. So voltammetry, so this, I'm just gonna give you the technique in a nutshell and do answer me questions. Because I guess one thing with IMC is that it's a very diverse audience. So if there's anything that's unclear, do ask me as, as I go through it. So voltammetry is an electrochemical technique what we do is, is, is we have an electrode that's in contact with neural tissue. We change the potential of this electrode, and then we measure the resulting electrochemical reactions as changes in current. What we then do is that we, we take data, we take a model that we have trained on data that we have collected in, in the laboratory to extract information from, from the current responses about the presence and the concentration of different neurochemicals of interest. And then we repeat this neurochemical fingerprinting 10 times every second, allowing us to monitor neuromodulators at a, at a very fast time scale. So, so in, in the work I'll present today, I'll mainly be focusing on dopamine and serotonin. Um, this is perhaps more for the aficionados, but, but it's just to show, so keep in mind that, that they, like, like any neuroimaging technique, you're not actually studying that exact biological process. So what we're, what we're working with are current responses, and we're extracting information about neurochemicals using data that we collected in the wet lab using a statistical model that we've trained in the wet lab, obviously also tested using cross-validation cross and so forth. Now I'm just gonna show some of the validation results that sort of support this approach. So what you see here are um, data from the wet lab, from the laboratory, where we vary the concentration of, dope, of serotonin here at the bottom and dopamine here at the top um, in increments of nanomoles. And then we look at the signal prediction, what our model says there is in this data, and how much dopamine and serotonin are present in this data. And this is data that the model has not been trained on. And as you can see, it's, um, it has a high level of accuracy. We've also done validation experiments in, in animal models um, where what we have done is, is using a technique called, called optogenetics, where you use light to, to activate particular neurons that are virally infected and therefore are sensitive to light. So what we have done is, is to activate these midbrain dopamine neurons which project into the striatum where we record from, and then we have our human electrode implanted into the striatum. And what you see here on the right are the signal predictions for dopamine when we stimulate using blue light, which activates the dopamine neurons and with red light, which does not activate the dopamine neurons. <coughs> what you see is that our approach is sensitive to the stimulation protocol. Yeah, that's a question. What, what kind of model is this? Is it a... Yeah, so we've used <coughs> different models. The model in this particular paper is an elastic net model, so it's a combination of lasso and rich regression. Um, I can talk more in detail about the model uh, towards the end, in case you're interested. And what we've used more recently, which um, I'm less familiar with the ins and outs of that, that particular model. We have used deep convolution neural networks to, yeah. to, because 
what we're not so much interested in understanding how the model works. What we're interested in is, is, is signal prediction yeah. and the performance of signal prediction. So yeah, so, so more recently we've moved towards even more flexible models, if you want. So any classic machine learning trick that works to predict dopamine from electrical current? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And um, I mean, I, I guess, so what people have done classically with voltammetry is that they've taken one or two concentrations, then they've measured a current response, and then they've looked at it, and then they say, oh, when I increase dopamine, the current response looks this way. And then sort of visually, you sort of match it to the ones, to the data you collect in vivo. Mm -hmm. So you're doing this kind of template matching. Whereas what we have done is to, so you're sort of doing signal reconstruction, if you like. Whereas what we do here is signal prediction, mm -hmm. where you then can borrow a lot of techniques from, from machine learning in order to optimize your, your prediction performance. That's nice. Anyway, so as I mentioned, um, the electrode has to be in contact with neural tissue, and obviously that's um, not something you, you know, commonly can get access to in humans. So what we do is, is that we combine the measurements with neurosurgical procedures that are already taken place for clinical purposes. And the first study I'll present the measurements have been done during um, implantation of a deep brain stimulating electrode. So you, um, you, might, you might have heard this particular procedure that's typically done in, in patients with Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. And then what's done is that an electrode is implanted into um, deep neural structures, in this case it's the soft dynamic nucleus. And then this electrode works like a, a pacemaker for the brain if you like. Uh, providing stimulation of this particular neural structure in order to alleviate, in this case, motor symptoms, <coughs> which are common in these disease In order to figure out where this electrode should be placed, obviously they have a good idea of where it should go based on previous knowledge and, 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 and scans of the patient prior to surgery. But also during surgery, they use another set of electrodes to stimulate around this area and then look at potential improvements in motor symptoms. So imagine that an electrode goes down, you stimulate, the patient performs various tasks like moving hand around or drawing, and then you look at offset in, 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 in symptoms associated with these disease states, and then that's a good candidate for placing the eventual electrode. What we do is, is, is before um, this stimulation procedure takes place, is, is that we insert an electrode that we can use for electrochemistry and then we record in a neural target that's more dorsal than the eventual DBS target. So we record from, from a, a brain area where their electrode is already, it's already gonna pass through that particular area, which is why you can justify recording from that area. If you're not gonna cause any damage that wouldn't have happened otherwise, um, and it's not gonna interfere with the, the clinical treatment. And as I mentioned, during functional mapping, you look for improvements in motor symptoms so patients are awake during this aspect, uh, during this part of the surgery. And this means that we can perform our measurements while people or patients perform um, various cognitive tasks. And this is kind of a, a, a unique um, setting. Um, so to date we've published three papers using electrochemistry in, in, in DBS patients. I'm just briefly gonna talk about the two first um, as I wasn't involved in those, then I'll go into more detail about the, the final study, which, which I let them be published a couple of years ago, two years ago. So the starting point for the first set of studies was the role of the striatum in reward-based decision-making, and in particular, the role of dopamine value coding. So <coughs> our measurements are all are naturally constrained by the surgical procedure, right? So, so this is their target. This is their preferred trajectory to that target. So we can only measure along this particular trajectory. And it just so happens that for, for these surgeries, we have an opportunity to stop off in the striatum, which is interesting for lots of different reasons. And in this particular study, you're interested in the role of the striatum in, in reward-based decision-making. A central hypothesis in neuroscience is that dopamine dopamine release into the strike and encodes reward prediction errors. So reward prediction errors are defined as the difference between 
the reward you actually got and the reward that you expected. So, so let's say you made some choice you thought it was gonna, you thought it was gonna be a good choice, but it turned out to be worse than expected. Then you have a negative reward picture. Huh? Let's say you made some choice you didn't think it was gonna be that good, but it turned out to be quite good, so you have a positive reward picture. Huh? And which is interesting for us because we can measure serotonin. It's also been proposed that serotonin plays the opposite role to dopamine, encoding reward prediction errors in the negative frame of reference, if you like. So you have this kind of opponency between these systems, and we can discuss later why it would be interesting to, to, to have a neural system wired up in this particular way. So in this first set of studies, what, what Ken and Ken Kishin and Rosalind Moran did was to ask patients to place bets on fluctuations in historical stock markets. So what you have to do, you see, you see the market evolve, and then you have to say at this point, do you think it's going to go up or down, so you invest some portion of your portfolio. So this might seem like a fairly abstract task as compared to sort of simple decision-making tasks you might do in animal models, but it's also to maintain um, a certain level of engagement with patients during, during the surgery. Now, because these fluctuations are not fully predictable, you're going to experience both positive and negative. Um, you're going to experience outcomes that were worse or better or worse than expected. In other words, you're going to experience positive and negative reward prediction errors. And what Ken and Rosalind found was that dopamine and serotonin <coughs> acted in the predictive manner. Dopamine increased when you had a positive reward prediction error, and serotonin increased when you had a negative reward prediction error. So I'm just going to leave this there and move on to the next study. It's just this particular motif of value coding is going to come back later. So, so we have evidence that dopamine and serotonin support value coding. However, the task I just showed you is a um, low dimensional probe of these systems, if you like. So we're only probing a single valence dimension from ranging from, from, from punishment to reward. And there's evidence that these systems play a much broader role in, in the control of cognition and, and behavior. For example, we have both human and animal studies or an human and animal evidence to suggest that the dopamine and serotonin plays a role in, in behavioral control in the, in the control of action with dopamine activating behavior, invigorating behavior, and serotonin inhibiting behavior. And this is a motif I'm going to come back to. And it's also more complicated than I've laid out here. Um, we know that, that, that serotonin does not just respond to punishment. Serotonin neurons can be activated by reward prediction cues, and serotonin can be activated by, since serotonergic neurons can be activated by both positive and negative reward prediction errors. Something I'm going to come back to as well. And it's, all, it's also not just a question of, of action and value. These systems also seem to be interested in, 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 in other dimensions, such as uncertainty about the environment, and associative learning more generally. So learning about the sensory statistics in the environment, not just learning action value, action outcome, or similar outcome associations. So what we did was to, to study these systems in the context of perceptual decision making, where variables relating to sensory inference, choice formation, and behavioral control are simultaneously in play. And the idea here is that if we use a more complex task, a more multidimensional task, we can better understand the contribution of these systems to cognition and behavior. Now, an issue with standard perceptual decision-making tasks is that they often conflate these component computations. So this is a common task in, in both human and animal neuroscience, the random dot motion task. And typically what you have to do is, is you have to say whether a field of dots is moving to the left or to the right. The difficulty of this particular decision is, is, is um, manipulated by varying the fraction of coherently moving dots here shown in pink relative to the proportion of, of randomly moving dots. So the higher the coherence, the easier the decision. So let's say we find that when coherence goes up, dopamine goes up. In this, in this standard task, it can be hard to interpret what this particular neural response means. For example, does dopamine track uncertainty about the sensory stimulus, which is lower when coherence is high, 
but does dopamine track the difficulty of the decision, which is easier when coherence is high, or does dopamine track the triggering of an action, which can be prepared, be prepared more quickly when coherence is high? So what we did was to, to use a task that I developed while I was a postdoc with, with Steve Fleming at UCL. Okay, so I'm just going to talk you through the task and, and do ask me if you're not familiar with this kind of sensory psychophysics um, setup or paradigm. So the first thing we did was rather than using just left versus right, we used a continuous range of motion directions. So in this case, the, the, dots on, the direction of dot motion is 10 degrees relative to the horizontal axis, but it could have been 90 degrees or any other direction. The second change we made is, is that we had a variable reference which only appeared after the offset of the motion stimulus. And what subjects had to do was to indicate whether they thought the direction of dot motion was towards, was towards the, the orange or the blue arc. In other words, whether the direction was clockwise or counterclockwise relative to the reference. So in this particular case, the, the correct answer would be orange. The direction is clockwise relative to the reference. But critically, you don't know that you have to respond orange until you've seen the reference. In other words, you can't prepare a decision until the reference has been displayed. So in this way, we break the relationship between sensory inference, inference about motion direction and choice formation, which also has to take into account this reference direction. So the reference, <coughs> sorry. So the reference is not um, shown in any of the trials or in some of the trials. It's shown in all trials, but you only see it after the stimulus is terminated. In all trials. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you, this is what you experience in all trials, except mm. the confidence part, which is only done in thirty-three percent of trials. So you see the motion stimulus, you get a sense of which way they're moving, and then later you're shown the reference that you have to judge the the motion direction against. Uh, it'll become even clearer on the next couple of slides. In, in addition to this, this so, oh, well, in addition to this dissociation of decision difficulty, sorry, of choice formation and sensory inference, we also manipulated the, the demands in these component computations. How? Yeah. Oh, I guess you're cutting it now. That's <laughs> 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 um, so, so the first thing we did was to, to create trials associated with different levels of sensory uncertainty. So this relates to this part of, of the task, the presentation of the motion stimulus. So what we did was to, to vary the fraction of coherently moving dots. So we had trials where a high fraction of, of the dots were moving coherently. So these would be trials characterized by low sensory uncertainty. And then we had trials where the fraction of coherent movement dots was low, so these would be trials characterized by high sensory uncertainty. If you, if you take the fraction of coherent dots all the way down to zero, you're just looking at randomly moving dots. And then we manipulated the difficulty of the decision by varying the distance between the average motion direction and the reference against which you had to judge the motion direction. So here, the higher the distance, the easier the decision, okay? So what this, this, what this two by two design, mean, design means is that you're gonna have trials where you feel fairly certain about the direction of dot motion, but the decision turns out to be hard because that direction is so close to the reference. Mm -hmm. Then you're gonna have trials where you feel uncertain about the direction of dot motion, but the decision turns out to be easy because the reference is so far away from where you thought the dots were moving. Okay, so I'll, I'll just talk you, maybe I should use the arrow here. So what we have here are behavioral results from five patients. So we have three patients with essential tremor indicated by ET, and then we have two patients with Parkinson's disease indicated by PD. And I'm showing the data separately for a, a session before the surgery, and then the data from, from the surgi surgical suite where we did our recordings. And what we have along the x-axis here is that we have distance, we have low distance and high distance, and then we use colors to indicate coherence. So we have low coherence in blue and high coherence in red. And, and what we see if we look over here is that we see that, that we 
have independent effects of sensory uncertainty and decision difficulty on choice performance, which is plotted along the y-axis. So first of all, um, <coughs> choice accuracy is high, and when, when coherence is high, the red line is above the blue line, and choice accuracy increases with distance. Both of these lines have a positive slope. Secondly, when we average uh, choice accuracy across all trials, we also see that our patient's performance falls within this gray band, which is reflective of the performance of a healthy control sample. So it suggests that we're looking at sort of normal perceptual decision-making performance. And perhaps most strikingly, we see that this, this overall pattern generalizes from the pre-surgical session where they're sitting in an experiment room with an experimenter to the surgical session where they're having brain surgery, which is two dramatically different sessions or settings. So this really demonstrates that you can run these kind of tasks in doing surgery. Okay, so a lot about the task, behavioral results. So what about dopamine and serotonin? So can, can I ask a few questions about the, <coughs> the slide? So what about, uh, is there an interaction in the pre-surgery? Is the slope increasing yeah, more so rapidly? Or not more rapidly, but it's Yeah, yeah, so this, so this, this um, an interaction, yeah. Mm. And um, that sort of played a fairly big role in, in the paper I did with Steve in yeah. uh, 2018. Um, but it, yeah, there's an interaction. Yeah. And is it also a three-way interaction, if you could see it like that, that the, like the, the, it becomes, you could say, the, the slopes are more similar in the surgery than in the pre-surgery? Yeah, so I, so I haven't done that analysis. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good question. I mean. Yeah, I mean, in, even if there were, I think it would be hard to figure out why that happened. Because, of course, it's a different setting, mm. a dramatically different setting. Mm. But obviously, the, the stimulus presentation is different as well. Mm. Because in the, in the pre-surgical session, you have more control over lightning and so forth. You have less control in the surgical session, and distance to monitor and so forth. Yeah. Their roles were, the monitors are slightly different. Okay. okay, so what about the neuromodulatory results? So, so we recorded from two neural structures. We recorded from the cortex, shown in green, and from the putamen, shown in blue. In, in primates, but not other animals, the striatum, the dorsal striatum is divided into these two structures by a white matter structure called the internal capsule, which sort of comes down through between these. And this there's evidence to suggest that these two structures, these two striatal structures, play, play different functional roles or are part of different functional loops. So we have a cognition loop, <coughs> which largely, largely passes through the cortex, receiving inputs from association areas, then ultimately returning outputs to prefrontal cortex. And then we have an action loop, which largely passes through the putamen, shown in blue, receiving input from sensory motor areas and then returning outputs to free motor areas. And we recorded from the, from the cordae in four patients and from the putamen in one patient. And I'm going to use this feature of the data to unpack the results. So we're first going to look at the, at the cordae data and we're going to ask whether dopamine and serotonin in the cordae track the cognitive variables as profile and design. And we're just going to look at the first three patients for, for reasons that will become apparent shortly. So, so here we have an example trial where, where, they, where the, um, the color indicates the level of, of serotonin as estimated by our prediction model. And the question is, when we see a particular response like this, does this reflect, it could reflect any of the different variables that we have put by our design. Did we see this pattern because coherence was low or because distance was low? Or was it due to the interaction as we just discussed? Was it due to that choice being correct? Or was it due to that choice being particularly fast? But because we've dissociated these variables by design, we're going to be able to tease apart these different potential contributions or signaling profiles in the neuromodulatory systems. And we're going to do this doing, using a regression-based approach, which is very similar to what you might know from FMI or MG. <coughs> So, more specifically, what we did is that we performed a sliding window regression. So, so here we have our design matrix, which are our different predictors. 
for each trial. So let's say on this particular trial, we have high coherence, low distance, and then we have the interaction term. And then we also control included terms related to choice accuracy and choice reaction time. And what we then do is we apply this design matrix um, to our neural model for data sliding through time. So, so, so fitting this model at each time point as we move through time. And what we get when we do this is that we get encoding profiles of beta time series, which quantify the relationship between our, between our task variables and the neuromodulatory responses. So, so in these plots, um, the two vertical lines indicate the onset of the, of the motion stimulus. And the second vertical line indicates the onset of the reference. And, and the line color indicates um, the different encoding profiles. So we have coherence in pink, distance in blue, and then the interaction in green. And overall, we don't see much going on in the dopamine data, but we do see this strong encoding of, of coherence in the serotonin data. In other words, what we see here is that when coherence is high, serotonin seems to drop and vice versa. So in other words, what that analysis suggests is that serotonin tracks sensory uncertainty. And this is a pattern we don't just see at the group level shown down here, but we see also see in individual patients. So take this patient as an example. What we see is that when coherence is, is low, as shown in blue, serotonin increases transiently, and when coherence is high, the serotonin dips transiently. And I'm going I'm to come back to why this particular signal profile, profile uh, is interesting more generally in, in, in a clinical context. This is a more complex aspect of the data, so just bear with me. As I mentioned, we, we left out one of the core patients, and, and, and the reason why we did that is that in this particular patient, we found this very peculiar um, set of results where it looks like there's encoding of task variables very early on in the trial. So here we see encoding of the interaction term early on in the trial, even though mm -hmm. the reference is not displayed until later. So you have this kind of in anticipatory encoding, if you like. And we obviously will then try to rule out various timing issues um, and so forth. But once we've done all that, um, then we wonder whether um, it might be that dopamine and serotonin are sensitive to experience cross-trial dependencies. It might be that there was some coincidental statistical structure in our task that these systems then tuned into and then happened to be realized as the task unfolded. Uh, can I? ask a follow-up for that. You had some participants that performed really poorly mm. and some that performed really well. So this particular uh, patient, yes. is that, does, does he yes. she belong in, in, in one of those? Uh, mm. Like, I can answer that question. I mean, I don't know the answer to it, but let's, let's find out. So this is um, okay, the fourth quarter patient, so this must be patient four indicated by the other way in the middle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this is for high coherence and this is for low coherence. So no, so this this patient performed fairly well compared to the others. But but then it's really so the the data that you get from the one with the the other tri the inverted triangle, what would you be able to um, Inf infer anything from that yeah. patient would, who is because completely on, tri on chance at chance what, level. Because what least. happens here is that here you have that very strong interaction effect that Mark mentioned, that when coherence is low, distance doesn't have much of an effect. But up here, when coherence is high, distance has a huge effect on their performance. So, so all of these patients are contributing sensible data in different ways. And also so, but in the pre-surgery, yeah. you don't really see that. So there's at least one guy. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at the old, like it's easy to see if you look to the right, right, like where you sum them up all triangles. And yeah. there seems to be almost a chance, the, the green pointing down triangle. Yeah, yeah right. but remember chance is 0.5, so this is substantially above chance. Yeah, it's, it's a lot better in the surgery, but yeah. it's the pre-surgery, like you yeah. see it's close to yeah. chance. And also in surgery, low coherence, also a chance level, no matter the distance. Yeah, that's true. It might be like a button effect. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, I think there are different elements in, in play here. It's, it's, the first one is that, is that those analyses control for choice accuracy and reaction time when we look at the encoding of those terms. So there's not necessarily um, a clear mapping between what that subject experiences and what turns out to be a correct or incorrect decision later on. So I think you can, laugh, to some extent, dissociate those variables. The second aspect is that, is that because the data is so rare, it would also be uh, foolish to throw out particular data points for sort of ad hoc criteria. So would we, the criteria we've used is, is, is overall performance, which in this case turned out to be all right. But yeah, like I mean, it's it's, it's a good point, and um, there's there's no going back if they if they are bad in, in, mm -hmm. in the surgical suite. But this particular patient turned out to have a fairly good level of performance. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so the the thinking here was whether these systems were sensitive to experience cross trial dependency. So how could this happen? So so our task turns the, the classic, in an abstract sense, turns the classic random.motion task into, into a discrete two by two design. And in this way, we get four distinct trial types. We have trials with high coherence, and then we have trials with low coherence, and then we have trials with, with a high distance or low distance. And then each of these four trial types could be followed by another of the same set of, the same set of trials. So we have 16 possible trial transitions in, possible, in, in total. And obviously these trial types were randomized, but could it be that there was any coincidental structure that these systems picked up on? And the reason why we're going down this path is that these systems are highly predictive systems that are trying to tune into any system in any kind of structure in the outside world. Um, what I'm showing here is, is, is um, the post hoc quantified experience transition probabilities um, associated with each trial type on the current trial, conditional on the previous trial type being characterized by high coherence and low distance. And what you see is that it just turns out that one of these trial types is, is less likely overall. And curiously, it turns out that the, the two systems track these transition probabilities. So what we show here is that along the x-axis, x-axis, we have the transition probability of a particular trial type ranging from on the left very unlikely to on the right very likely. And then on the y-axis, we have the average response of that system, average over from the onset of the trial until some time later. And what we see is that both of these systems track these experience transition probabilities. Um, so that transition, in, in like if you count about them, almost always, like in, in the way that I at least implement these counterbalancing, it would always be the least likely, right? Like no matter what, often, I don't know how you did it here, but often you have like this set of 16 that you shuffle around, mm -hmm. and then you repeat that over and over with different shufflings, right? So it would always be the least likely, given that yeah. it's been there, because then there'll be one less of those. Yeah. But I, I agree, it, look, it looks yeah, so, like, in so this particular yeah. case, it, lo it looks like so even more less likely. Yeah, so what's, what's different here is that, um, so it's not counterbalanced, they're, they're, they're sampled from probability distribution, so okay. the stimulus parameters. So it's like in the uniform? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so on any given trial, there's a 50% probability that, yeah, 25% probability that's going to be in these trial types, mm. which is why that you can end up with having yeah. very on counterbalanced yeah. designs. But then you don't have an equal number of trials of each type, correct? Right. Yeah. Which is okay because they're doing single trial statistics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there's there's not an even number of trials, but there are lots of those trials. Yeah. So this is this doesn't mean that this particular combination doesn't occur often. It just means that this transition happens rarely. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. But I mean I mean, we also flag this as such. This is like very post hoc 
mm -hmm. trying to make sense of, of yeah. the data that we saw. That makes sense. Okay, so, so the last patient is, is our Pitamin patient. And in this particular patient, we didn't see any encoding of these cognitive variables, which fits with the idea that there's this cognition action, separation between the, the cortex and the Pitamin. So the question then is whether in this patient, we see encoding of the moment of choice as, as, as predicted by theory. And the answer is yes, we do. Um, so what I'm showing here is, is the average dopamine and serotonin responses averaged across all trials. And again, we have the first line indicates the onset of motion stimulus. The second line indicates the onset of the reference. And this is the point in time at which you can make a choice. The pink histogram shows the distribution over choice reaction time overlaid onto this um, time window. And on the left, we have very, very fast trials, and on the right, we have very slow trials. So you get this classic reaction time distribution, if you like. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that, is that dopamine ramps up and serotonin ramps down around the moment of choice. And we didn't see this response pattern in the chordate in any of the four coordinate patients, which again fits with this cognition action separation. Now, these data suggests that the, these systems could act like an action trigger, if you like. And if this is true, then we should see these changes, these deviations from zero, earlier on faster trials. So, so to test this particular prediction, what we did was to take our trials shown here, where the the darkness of the color indicates the time taken to make a choice. And then we group them into fast, medium, and slow trials based on tercels. And the prediction is that, that, that these deviations I just showed you should happen earlier on faster trials if, if these systems are, 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 are locked to the onset of a choice. And this is indeed what we see. Um, so what we see is that dopamine peaks earlier on faster trials shown in pink and later on slow trials shown in blue. And the same happens for, for serotonin. And, and that these systems are locked to choice becomes particularly apparent when we then realign the time series to the moment at which they press the button. Because what we see here is that, is that dopamine and serotonin peak around at the same time regardless of the time taken to make a decision. So they peak around the time at which a button is pressed regardless of the time elapsed up until that point in time. Mm. So, to, sort of, if, if you like to use a car metaphor, the, the thinking or the interpretation of these results is that dopamine plays the role of the accelerator, it invigorates, activates movement, where serotonin plays the role of the handbrake. You have to release the handbrake in order for movement to take place. And this very much fits with, with the animal literature and these systems in the domain of action control, where the thinking is that dopamine activates behavior and the serotonin plays the role of an in inhibitor on behavior. Thank you, Majesty, as well. Yeah. And so you mentioned a few times here that, uh, that they have, like, I agree, like visually they have the same behavior, but I guess depending on, on the model you're using that, or you are using, we can just statistically, right? That's, that's not really a, a claim that you can substantially make that it's the same, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you, is, is, it's so would it matter to your interpretation if you would? I'm not sure I would throw no. you know, patient statistics at, at, at this as well. But so it you doesn't matter for your interpretation, like whether or not they, like you have to make a strong interpretation that they're the same because you cannot. This yeah. So so what you mean is that is that I'm a, so it's just to get it right. So you mean that I'm, I'm I'm implying that I I see this in this particular patient and I don't see this in these patients where it's from a different structure. But you're, you're thinking no, I'm just saying that you're, you're saying that we see them. the same thing at the button press, like. So relate, not related to whether or not it's a patient, sorry, but yeah. just you're saying that you're seeing the, the same building up for the slow, medium, and fast. Yeah. And I agree visually that's what you see. But if, ah, but, no. but I mean, in terms of the statistical interpretation that you can make from, from a model where you sort of look, so what you're looking at here is, is whether or not they're different from zero each other. Yeah. But you're not saying, whether they're you cannot same. say that the same, yeah. right? You, you would be able yeah. to say that slow, medium, and fast would differ Build up if they did, yeah, but you cannot say they're the same, right? No, no, I, no, no, I agree, but I, I think, um, yeah, I think, I, th I think that that is true. I mean, my suspicion would be that that, that would return a null result 
but with a lot of uncertainty <laughs> around it. Mm. Yeah. So, it's a, that, so yeah, my suspicion is by database and analysis, you would say they're not different, but the, the evidence in favor of that hypothesis is not uh, okay. very strong, just because of the, the trial numbers going into it. Okay. But yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I was making a different point, which was that I was making these claims about differences between patient groups. Yeah. Um, yeah. But obviously, I haven't tested for interactions with recording signs and so yeah, forth. Okay. But yeah, again, that's based on uh, vi 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 visually, they, they seem different. OK, so I'm just going to briefly talk about the serotonin results before I move on to I have take another five, 10 minutes. OK, so we saw the serotonin tract uncertainty about a short-lived sensory stimulus. I think this is the first time that this particular computational motif has been, been shown in, in, in any species. But there are studies which have linked serotonin to uncertainty in other domains in particular. In, in the domain of reward-based uh, decision-making or reward-based learning. So, so as I mentioned before, there's this notion of reward prediction errors that range from negative to positive reward prediction errors, from outcomes that were worse than expected to outcomes that were better than expected. And interestingly, it turns out that, that, dopamine, that, that serotonin is also interested not in the designed reward prediction error, but the absolute reward prediction error. That is how far you are away from zero, which is your expectation. So there are studies such as this one from Jeremy Cohen's lab, which shows that serotonin, serotonergic neurons increase the firing rate with this absolute reward prediction error is high. So you can think of the absolute reward prediction error as an indicator of surprise or uncertainty about those statistical associations in the world. And what it also shows that that learning seems to be faster after large that's the reward prediction errors now for larger serotonin deviations from baseline, yeah? Is it only reward prediction error or is it prediction error? Uh, yeah, so, so, so I think almost all of this stuff is about prediction of reward. There is a question as to whether these systems play a role in statistical learning more generally. Um, th those those particular things can be hard to study in an animal because you need to operationalize their behavior, which usually you would do through rewards and punishments. But there is studies that suggest that, that dopamine, I don't know about serotonin, but that dopamine doesn't just, it's not just involved in learning associations between stimuli or actions and outcomes, but also in involved in learning stimulus-stimulus associations which might be involved, important for learning a model of the world, but are not immediately important for, for rewarding it now. Is that, is that kind of what you have in mind? Yeah, so it's a quite a big difference if, if they're related to surprise in general? Yeah. Or if yeah, they're so related here, to reward? Yeah. yeah, so here it's surprise about reward. the delivery of a reward. Yeah. Here it's surprise about the identity of a sensory stimulus, which perhaps is, is one step removed from mm -hmm. reward. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, I guess, in, in the case of dopamine in particular, it's something that's hotly debated yeah. as to whether they're just involved in reward prediction errors or prediction errors mm -hmm. more generally. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there's also causal evidence for the role of serotonin in learning and, and through this potential uncertainty or surprise mediated mechanism. So, so what, so what it is. What they showed from Zach Maimon's lab is, is that if you optogenetically activate serotonin neurons on pati in particular points in time, then those experiences have a large influence on future behavior, which is another piece of evidence for the role of serotonin in learning and mediating learning. And I think this is sort of uh, the current thinking and, and, and something I hope to explore in more depth in the future, is that this is one of the reasons where there's, um, I think there's a potential link between these laboratory findings and then the clinical context in which these systems are also studied. And in particular, um, there is this idea that, um, that depression and anxiety, for example, are, are associated with serotonergic dysfunction. And these particular conditions are associated with maladaptive patterns of behavior and thought being stuck in, 
in those maladaptive patterns. And there's also the thinking that, that at least th there's evidence that, that, that intervention with neuromodulatory systems in these conditions can, can lead to improvement, in particular the use of SSIs or antidepressants. And what these agents do is that they, it's very complicated, but, but naively, at least on a short time scale, they, they increase serotonin levels in the brain. And, and, and one potential mechanism by which they then might lead to an improvement is not through direct effects on mood, as you might commonly think like of dopamine or serotonin as pleasure molecules or, or, well, or happiness molecules, but rather through increased plasticity in the system. So the idea is that, is that these pharmacological agents allow you to break out of maladaptive patterns of thought and action mm -hmm. through in increased plasticity or being more receptive to new incoming information, which also would fit with the idea that, that SSIs work better if combined with cognitive behavioral therapy, where you identify cognitive targets for change. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so I have how long? It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll discount all the all the questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, it, don't it's worry not about that much. Um, yeah. So, so up until this point, I've spoken about measurements made during DBS surgery. But recently, we've also been able to do measurements in epilepsy patients who are undergoing epilepsy monitoring. So, what's different between these cases is that in epilepsy, monitoring electrodes are implanted throughout the brain, not just in, in striatal structures. So, this allows us to to do electrochemical recordings in other neural structures than those we can do in DBS surgery. And it also allows us better to study other neuromodulatory systems, such as noradrenaline, because it's believed that the noradrenaline system doesn't really innovate these particular structures, but other structures in the brain. And they become more accessible through, these, through this platform. And in the last couple of minutes, I'm, I'm just going to talk about a study in which we did measurements from the amygdala in two patients in, and, w and where we were in particular interested in noradrenaline. <coughs> so this is the workflow. The, the patients uh, have electrodes implanted during general anesthesia that then stay in the epilepsy monitoring unit for days or weeks where activity, uh, different neural structures are recorded in order to identify the source of the epileptic seizures once the monitoring is done, then the electrodes are explanted. Um, so it's a temporary procedure. And then what we do is that then we, we do a research study while they're staying in, in the EMU. And then we recover the electrodes and then we train our signal prediction model on that specific electrode and generate our predictions. And this is, uh, this is um, this neural network based model that, that I mentioned before. And I'm just showing the performance of our approach when studying noradrenaline. So here we are varying noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin. And as you can see, um, our predictions of noradrenaline only increase when we actually vary noradrenaline, but not when we vary the other neuromodulators. So what we're interested in in this study is, is the link between pupil dilation and activity in the noradrenaline system. Because obviously, it's hard to study these systems in humans. So we can use behavioral proxies for how these systems operate. and often often used behavioral proxy is pupil dilation. And the idea is that, that the, the larger the size of the pupil, the more active this, this particular neuromodulatory system is. So we know that these systems, pupil dilation, and the noradrenaline system all seem to be interested in arousal, attention, and surprise. We also know that activity in, in locus ceruleus neurons, which are responsible for the release of noradrenaline throughout the brain, that activity in these neurons predicts pupil dilation. We also know that activity in these axons also predict pupil dilation. But the question is, and which has never been studied, is whether release of noradrenaline into target neural structures also correlates with pupil dilation. So to, to study this question, we did a visual affective oddball task. So patients did view six blocks of 100 images the images were separated by one second blank interval, so it's a regular stimulus interval. So you see a blank for one second, then you see a stimulus for one second blank stimulus. 
80% of the stimuli were the standard stimulus, which is just a checkerboard image, and then 20% of the stimuli were oddball stimuli, so they were images. And all the patients have to do is to press a button whenever an oddball stimulus was shown. Now, you, you were not just interested in this particular contrast, but also whether responses to the oddball stimulus changes with the cognitive state that patients might be in. We tried to manipulate the cognitive state by varying the, the emotional content of these images, if you like. Um, so, so we sampled stimuli from what's known as the International Effective Picture System, the IF system. And as you can see from these images, it's a very old system, but it's uh, normatively established. And these are not exactly from the IF database, but just from a paper that I found on the internet, <laughs> um, which also used the IFs. So you have neutral images. I don't know if you find this neutral man looking at a computer. You have negative images um, varying, again, normatively, as, as rated by a large population in, in arousal, low arousal and high arousal images. And you have positive images, again, varying in arousal. So by sampling images from these systems, we could create a, a two by two design, if you like. So we had images associated with low or high arousal, and we had images associated with negative or positive valence. And then we also have some neutral trials. And we did this in a blockwise manner. So, so these particular conditions correspond to a block of, of, of stimuli. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, I'm just Quickly go through this. So, so what we found in so what we found in the first subject is that when we separate our responses by our, our into our four key conditions, then we see that the relationship between noradrenaline and pupil dilation depends on the cognitive state. So, the black line is always pupil dilation, and then the colored line is our estimate of noradrenaline. And what you see here is that there's a tighter coupling between these two signals when arousal is high as opposed to when arousal is low. And here I'm just showing data averaged across valence into low arousal and high arousal. And down here I'm showing an estimate of, of the correlation between these signals. So this is a quantified this using, using a hidden market model. Those details are not important. But what you can see and what the model, what, what the statistical code suggests is that there's an anti-correlation when arousal is low and a positive correlation when arousal is high. And this is not something we, so we see in relation to the presentation of off-ball stimuli. We also see it in relation to the presentation of the standard stimulus suggesting that this general coupling, deep anti-correlation and correlation is related to some general cognitive state, if you like. Um, in the second subject, the data was a lot noisier. Um, we saw some indication of a tighter coupling on high arousal trials, but we also have trials like this one where it's negative, lower arousal, which suggests that there's an interaction effect. But we couldn't fit our HMM to each of these separate conditions. We had to average across the, 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 the different levels of, 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 a, of a factor. Um, and when we then do low versus high arousal, we get noisy estimates, but we see a similar similar trend where the correlation is higher in higher arousal blocks. And then when we now look at valence, what we see is that there seems to be, again, quite noisy estimates. There seems to be a, a correlation for negative valence and an anti-correlation for positive valence. So I went through this quite quickly, so we can always come back to it. Um, but the general thinking is that, yes, there is a correlation between pupil dilation and your adrenaline release. But this relationship um, um, varies in a, in a state-dependent manner, if you like. Um, one advantage of being able to do these recordings in epilepsy patients is that they're staying in the EMU for, for multiple days or weeks. So a lot of the stuff I've showed you is this experiment we've done in 30 minutes. But because they're staying in the EMU, EMU for so, such a long period of time, you can do more naturalistic experiments. So for example, um, the noradrenaline system is thought to, to, to control states of, 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 of wakefulness and sleep. Sleep medication also affects the noradrenaline system. So you might be able to study 
how no adrenaline changes as people transition in and out of these states. You, some of the patients will also be undergoing pharmacotherapies for other conditions. They might be anxious or, or be depressed. So you can look at what happens to serotonin signaling immediately after they've taken their daily dose of, of medication. You can also look at what happens after food intake or after exercise. So it opens up for a much broader range of experiments. Okay, so, so the coming full circle, so I've spoken about the work that I'll do here, and I just wanted to briefly mention, as Pastor now has already mentioned, is that I'm returning permanently to um, August next year. Uh, I'm already here as a guest researcher, and I'm very much um, looking forward to that transition. And then, finally, I just want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>